Welcome to episode 103 of The Neuro Show. In today's episode... Cycling News have reviewed the Factor Ostrovam and they're saying it is potentially the new market leader road bike over the S-Works Tarmac SL8. We chat through it all. BMC Team Machine R Masterpiece. $9,000 for a frame. What do we think? We've got a breakdown of Tadej Pogacar's win at the World Championships and some interesting chat from Pogacar's interview with Peter Atiyah as well. All right, let's get into it. I wanted to try this week, Jesse. So there's been bits of news, a few drops, a few articles, things like that. And what I wanted to sort of do is maybe go through the the main ones and potentially get your quote unquote reaction to some of that some of that information. What do you, what do you think? Please, let's let's do it because you've got a laundry list of stuff you've you've gone through here. I've been I've been yes, I didn't quite drop down the rabbit hole that you went down last week, but I certainly did find find a few bits and pieces that that popped out. And it's a little bit linked to to last week's chat the first one and that is the new Factor Ostro van. So this has been sliding a little bit under the radar for the last, so it was launched. I'm going to say, was it Australian National Champs that was the whole? It was around like, then. So it, it was a yeah. sort of January, February 2024. We were starting to see it, and yeah, I think it was Simon Clark's bike, wasn't it, at, at National Champs? Anyway, came out then, and I think I wouldn't. I I didn't like particularly the the, the aesthetic look of it, but. Since then, we've seen, well, obviously we saw that 11 bike test that we talked about that it performed pretty damn well in. We've seen its wheels perform pretty damn well in some, some independent testing. And now we're starting to see some like solid reviews, long-term reviews come out on the bike and spoiler alert, they're super, super positive. In fact, I'd argue they're glowing. So this review is actually the man himself, Josh Croxton, the man who did the 11 bike mega tests. And he did a review on cycling weekly, no cycling news. Sorry. Did you get a chance to have a look at some of this? Yeah, I had to read through, I had to look through. I mean, it's pretty crazy. This is now at a stage where the, the big magazines and the, the big media are are pinning this up side by side against the S Works SL8 as the market leader, do it all aero lightweight package. I mean, that's what this essentially review is is pointing at. Did you want to go through the specifics? How he how is he Josh reaching the conclusion that this is now arguably the market leader over an S Works SL8? So in that eleven bike test, it outperformed the S Works in quite a, a number of the factors, but also. It was at the head of the pack when it came to the do it all bike category, which up until now, like you said, the, the SL8 has very much been the, the sort of clubhouse leader when it comes to that. So if you have a look at some of the other specifics, so he mentions here, so the weight wise, the Ostro comes in at 7.23 with complete with pedals, bottles, cages in a Dura A spec with no power meter. That's 50 grams more than the S-Works Tarmac SL8. However, he sort of does mention that that was running the new red axis, which does have a slightly lighter build than the Dura. So you're very, very similar when it comes to that. But a little bit of the devil's in the detail with that, and that is in the wheels, because a lot of the weight savings of that of the, the new Ostro can be attributed to the new black ink wheels at 48 mils front, 58 mils rear. And they're coming in under 1,300 grams, so 1,296 tested, which is almost 200 grams less than the comparable Roval Rapid CLX 2s. So whilst it's certainly competing when it comes to, to the weight, well, ultimately the package is pretty much on par with, with each other. So if you, if you have a do-it-all bike, that is testing aerodynamically as fast as the SLA. It's weighing basically the same as the SLA. You're going a long way to be competing with the SLA for that crown. 
So specs wise, it's it's certainly starting to to get on par. I did I did want to pick out one of the comments that he made in one of the paragraphs when he talked about the frame itself. And it was the carbon fiber used on the down tube is so thin that you can flex it with your hand. You probably shouldn't because you can damage the layers of fiber, but it shows how far the brand has gone to minimize weight. Does, does, just just slight side project here. Does that bother you in any way, shape or form? Like, do you want to, do you want to give the Tavello behind you there a little, a little squeeze? A little, and let me know if you've got any play in there. It's definitely, it's not moving by hand. Um, like that, that. Is that a good thing? Um, I, I, uh, I mean, you're going to, I mean, that's, that's the race to the bottom, if you want to call it that, or the race to the thinnest possible sidewall of carbon that you're going to end up with, because to make a frame set lighter, what do you have to do? use less carbon it's this it's not complicated and so that's um probably something that the individual is going to have to decide um even especially because the factor only comes in that that ostro van that's it factor ostro van whereas if you were uh, buying a specialized you may want to make the decision between do you get the s works model which is going to be closer to that uh, thinner sidewall that you'd probably be getting on the factor versus you just go to the specialized pro model, which is heavier, but also is not going to be able to be crushed with your hands. What? You know, that's choice. I love the fact that he tried. So he actually included, Josh tried to include a section called value, right? When it comes to these bikes, which. Uh, if if this was on YouTube, that would be the most liked comment underneath this video would be, how can you call a $20,000 bike value? But he did. He tried to actually have a category in here called value. And he, he did you see this? Did you see which, which card he played for, for what, what was actually value when it comes to this bike? I didn't. I'm so, cause you can kind of, you can twist and turn and an angle from value pretty, you know, a hundred different ways, but I'm interested. So, he, how so he's it? gone the customize route for value. And I don't mind this. So essentially playing off the fact that <laughs> putting aside the actual price, the fact that you can do a Jesse coil here, you can really build a speck of bike down to a lot of details so you can you can configure the cockpit quite customizable actually I had a little look myself and you can you can do a 130 with like a 36 centimeter bar on there um so that's quite sorry 38 centimeter bar with 130 stem so that's pretty customizable um you you can do a 36 actually they got the 36s everywhere from 80 up to 140 length uh, you've got, um, so that's the handlebar fit. You've got the saddle setback. So you've got your zero offset or your, your, um, your actual 25, what is it? Um, degree offset on there. Um, you've got crank lengths. So all the things. Crank lengths between one, at least on the Australian site, between 170 and 175. So. And if there's been one common thread to any S, in fact, literally last week was talking to someone who's just bought an SL8. And they're still waiting for their integrated, um, well, they, are they called Roval, the handlebars? Yeah. So they, they're basically on a six month wait for the integrated ones. So they're having to put on normal ones. So this is clearly trumping that when it, when it comes to that. And when it comes to value, you, you get exactly what you want. I'll, I'll allow that. Okay. Okay. I, I mean, I agree. Yep. I, I, I like that. I don't quite, you know, you customize, but cranks go only down to 170. Yeah. <laughs> Almost. Um, a couple of things. I, I, I mean, I, with the overall gist of this review Josh has done, I, I like, and I, I, I agree with almost all of it. And as, uh, I've had some writers ask, uh, sort of, they've got, 
budget's not really too much of a concern. They're looking at the top end bikes across the mainstream brands. You know, what what are they like? What should they get? Oh, Jesse, what do you think about the factor versus this? Most of the time, I do think it is a compelling package. I do think it's it is it is competitive. There was only one part of the the review as well. I I'm just going to nitpick on, and that was these wheels. So, um, he rated the overall build a ten out of ten. Um, because uh, brilliant spec all round with a cockpit and wheels that are market leading in their own right. That's just one where I would say their wheels are good. I wouldn't say they're market leading. Uh, remembering. The they are light, so they're sub thirteen hundred grams, like twelve ninety, which isn't, which is not market leading. That's light, but there I can name a multiple wheel sets which are lighter than that for that depth. And just in terms of the width, for most people that are going to be doing mixed road riding, road racing on a variety of surfaces, they're only a twenty nine millimeter external. Oh, what's the coil? So you really the uh, the the percentage is. Also 79, so it's above 75. So it's a 23 internal with a 29 external, which means you put a 28 mil tire on there with a 23 internal, that'll probably blow up to about 30 mil wide and measured width. And that's about as wide as you're going to be. I should, I want to pick my words carefully. That's not as wide as you would want to use, but that's as wide as the rim is optimized for. And they say that. They say it's optimized for a 28 mil tire, which will probably stretch to 30, which is good but i don't think it's market leading again for me market leading for most people mixed terrain is external width 32 and above um so yeah the wheels are good not excellent from in my opinion so that was that's the only thing there um where i would start to go imagine if these came with um a reserve rim laced with some carbon spokes and the, the black ink light hubs then you'd be going and you can spec it with a 36 wide handlebar, zero offset seat post. I mean, that's where you're starting to go. <laughs> wow. Like that's pretty much ticking nearly every box. Okay. Quick word from today's show partner, Pillar Performance. Traditional nutrition products like hydration and carbohydrates will take you through to the finish line, whereas Pillar's mission is to get you to the start line in the best condition over and over. In this episode, Pillar wants to bring awareness to the benefits that magnesium supplementation can have for you as a cyclist, particularly as it relates to sleep and recovery. Do you have trouble getting to sleep each night? Or do you suffer from reduced sleep quality, particularly after your biggest training days? If so, magnesium supplementation can help Improve all areas of your sleep by regulating melatonin production and reducing cramps that interrupt your sleep quality. Pillar's Triple Magnesium is a 300 milligram blend of absorbable forms of magnesium that tastes great and is informed sport batch tested to be free from banned ingredients. If you would like to try Pillar today, get 15% off by using code Nero at pillarperformance.shop or for North American listeners and viewers, head to thefeed.com slash pillar and enter code Nero for 15% off. A big shout to Pillar Performance for supporting today's episode. The other customizable thing that I wanted to mention was the the paint job thing. Again, yes, I, I am aware of what that's doing to, to the price of it. But when you're starting to spend this amount of money and you can design your own custom paint job, that's a nice, that is a, that is a value add. And I have seen a couple of those, I think they're called Plasma, Plasma Studios versions in real life and they do an absolutely class job of it. But it brings up an interesting question with it because we had this discussion the other day, like it was a bit about factor. So just in terms of the the color scheme, right? So if you do it through the website, so you buy the factor, you do the whole paint thing through the website, it's $500 on factors own website. But if you're in the UK and you buy your factor at a UK distributor, he gave the example of Veris Velo, it can be as high as 1,200 pounds. And you and I were both like, yeah, what's the story with Factor? Because you can, you can, it's essentially Canyon. Like I can go on there now and, and spec my bike out. It arrives, I think you, you spec'd my Austro Van Mountain. It was going to arrive at the end of October, I think. 
Yeah, it was shipping between the 15th and the 30th of October, which is in between two and three weeks-ish from when we're chatting. And there's a bike shop here in, in Noosa, Cycle Sportif. I think that's what they're called. They're a factor distributor. Big factor sign out the front. You can walk into the shop and you can buy the bike like you would at a bike shop. And it's, I find it weird because, like, does that mean then that when you buy it through the website that they're factoring in extra like extra sort of cut for the the retail people that are, that are subsequently losing out on this this purchase that you're making. Yeah, can I can I go in deep? I did a bit of research. I got some numbers. So I I because I, I find this really interesting because this has been a shift over the last really only two years where the big brands Trek, Specialized, and Factor, as we've seen now, are they have retail stores. And you can buy online, ship ship to your front door. But from what I can tell, they're not actually direct to consumer. It's a kind of a strange setup. And I, I want to chat about it because uh, I don't want to bury the lead. If you're buying direct to consumer or directly online and there's no bike shop, there should be, it should be cheaper. There should just be less cost. So... If I go and uh, I think it's a bit funny with Factor that I just want to pick into first because if you go into F- um, Factor's website and you're in Australia, it re- it relinks to au.factorbikes.com, and then if you scroll down, um, the actual company is not Factor Bikes, it's Factor Bikes Australia, and I'm pretty sh- certain that's a separate company with all its tax paying and all it's set up in Australia. And, and even though you're, it, it, I think it's coming through them as a distributor. And so it's a buy online, but you've still got that middleman coming through locally. It's, I, I'm pretty sure it's not like Canyon where that bike's coming directly from factor in Taiwan and being shipped here, even though it kind of looks that way. And you can tell that because, well, the price is the same. Um, so, just in terms of the price, I'm not sure how it works for Specialized and Trek, how that works in Australia, but if you're avoiding going to a bike shop and having to go through the Australian distributor, it goes without saying the bike should be cheaper. There's less margin there. Because remember um, Escape Collective and I think it was Ronan and McLaughlin did the whole chat with Factor about why are modern bikes so expensive? And he laid out bit by bit all the all the cost and he was saying um the distributor in your domestic country takes 30 percent margin and then the retailer is putting on another 30 percent so there's a huge chunk of cash and I, i went through just to kind of estimate um if factor were doing direct to consumer what would we expect to pay for that bike what would what would sort of be reasonable uh, so if we look at the uh, Dura Ace version in Australian dollars, we'll just be working in Australian dollars here. Uh, current retail price is eighteen thousand two hundred ninety nine dollars. So if they went, th- th- if we're looking at a direct to consumer model, uh, there would be savings that the company makes, like not having to pay the retailer and some others. And then there's, it's not quite as simple as saying, well, you save all that money, and then the, for the pr- therefore the price is the current price minus all that because there are expenses involved with running direct to consumer side of a business. And so I've gone through and kind of estimated roughly what these would be. So what are your savings if you went to direct to consumer? Well, you wouldn't have the sea freight shipping to get that container of factors from Taiwan to Australia. And based on the article Escape Collective did, that's about 72 Aussie dollars per per, fr- per, per, per bike to get it here. So you take that off. The shipping insurance that was about 28 Australian dollars per per bike when that sits on the container. Import customs and duties. Now, assuming that they are accurately declaring it, it's about 10% you've got to pay. So if each bike, if the cost price that the distributor was paying was 10 grand for an 18 grand bike, that'd be $1,000 per bike they're paying in duties. Then you've got the distributor margin on that. So they take that, they put on a 30% and then they hand it over. And so that's saving 10% of, uh, 30% of that would be uh, about $3,300. You've then got the retailer margin. That's then 30% of 
the original the the cost price plus the the deal is thirty percent. So that's four four thousand two hundred dollars that the retailer is making. So if I total that up, you've got about eight thousand six hundred dollars out of the eighteen thousand dollar bike, which should be saved by going direct to consumer. So if factor was then truly direct to consumer. What expenses would they have to factor in? Because it's not as simple as taking that eight thousand six hundred off the price, as I said. So, you that there would be a shipping cost to go from Taiwan to my front door, which is actually very expensive for an entire bike in a box, which might be what uh, twelve kilos, maybe thirteen kilos. Um, now, I've estimated it's really hard to get an accurate price. I've estimated that about twelve hundred Australian dollars for a FedEx or a DHL international bike shipping. Um, internal logistics. So if Factor didn't go and send just shipping containers to a distributor in Australia and had to have staff to manage the sale and the assembly of the bike so it's more ready to be built and the shipping of that out, etc. Let's say 500, let's be generous, $500 Aussie per bike that's sold is for them to run their direct-to-consumer sales and assembly and things like that. Uh, again, import duties, 10% that they would be paying that so the customer doesn't have to pay it. So they'd do the paperwork for that before it leaves. That'd, that'd be $1,000. And then other little excess one is additional marketing mm. cost because when you're... When a distributor is buying three containers of factors, when Factor Bike Australia buys all those containers, well, part of their margin goes to marketing costs locally here in Australia. So, for example, like when we were, when you were, I wasn't on the team managing the team then, but when you were running Nero, you were riding Bianchi bikes. And so you were working with the distributor for Bianchi bikes in Australia. I mean, you were getting the frames for free, but there was maybe a, a, a slight discount and they were helping build the bikes. So there was money there that this distributor was, or, or at least time that the distributor was outlaying to get a local Australian team on those bikes, which they want to sell. And so if you just cut out the distributors, well, Factor would probably need to do more Australian domestic marketing to some degree, you would have thought. So I've put that in as uh, $300 per bike they sell, um, sort of cost of selling a bike. You, know, you spend three hundred dollars of marketing, you sell a bike. It's a pretty reasonable amount to assume. So that that all that total that I have to add on is three thousand um, dollars. So the current retail price of that Dura Ace factor is eighteen thousand two hundred ninety nine. And so if I take the the difference between what they're saving and then their expenses, really the direct to consumer price is twelve thousand six hundred and ninety nine Australian dollars for that Dura Ace model. So. Basically, for the consumer, five thousand six hundred dollars cheaper. Now, obviously, I'm I'm not a, a <laughs> cycling distribution <laughs> industry network expert. I probably missed a few things, but that's sort of my numbers there. Um, and the reason why I wanted to do that whole thing is because, well, right now, if I go on to Factor and I click order now and they ship it to my door, I'm paying the same price if if I went to a bricks and mortar store and kick the tires for three hours and then didn't buy it and then went back and wasted all their time and all that, ex and them building the bike. I've got all that extra expense and I'm paying the same price if it's used to ship it to me. Uh, to There's me, that doesn't so make any much sense. in there. Geez, you're on fire with your research, can I there, just say, yeah. Jesse? Um, <laughs> firstly, it's interesting that the number that you've ended up on isn't too far away from what a canyon costs. Like if you go on to Canyon mm -hmm. now, that's mm -hmm. what I think, what a CFR is like 13, 14,000 Australian dollars. It's, yeah, it's a bit, I, I did this comparison with, because I was curious. So that again, just to read the numbers, if people are sort of getting lost in my uh, mumbo jumbo of numbers, I'm saying the rough direct to consumer cost of that Durace factor is 12,700, a factor is 15,100. That's the CFR with the Jura Ace. That's no, that's Canyon. So, so Canyon CFR. Okay, it's not. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry, Canyon. Yeah, the Canyon, the top spec Canyon Air Road. So it's not that price, but it's basically splitting the difference between that number I've come up with and then the retail price of the factor. It's sort of in the middle. So instead of 12.7, it's 15. But here's the question, right? Like it's, you've, you've set it out really well. But here's the question. I wonder how many people actually buy their twenty thousand or their 
what is it, 18,000 Australian dollar Durace Factor Ostrovan directly through the website. I, I, I would argue it's actually not very many. And, and I think this comes back to, so this is a premium brand that, as we've said, it only has one model, unlike Canyon. And, and and so then to be charging premium prices and just be a website, I think that would, even for a brand that's done pretty well at creating froth for itself, like I would say market leading at creating froth for itself, it would be a struggle. And to kind of follow up even on the, the Canyon thing, I wonder how many CFRs are sold because, I mean, I don't see many if any, actually. The CLX is easily the most popular canyon I see. Um, can, I, can I just, just on that point though, and I haven't made up my decision, I'm just kind of throwing questions at you, but why is it an option then to just hmm. have it shipped to your front door? If the value is in the bike shop experience, force people to go to the bike shop. Is that, is that fair? I mean, I... I I feel like we're in a little bit of an awkward, I want to have my cake and eat it between, and it's not just factor, specialized. I can go and order a $20,000 S-Works right now and <laughs> it'll show up at my front door. And so Maybe, yeah, potentially, but maybe it's just a shop window. Maybe it's just for dickheads like us who are surfing around and want to just, you know, you, you get a little vibe to, oh, I'm going to build up an Ostro van and see what, it, and, and you do, you get in there and you build it up and then you don't actually hit buy now, but it just starts the, the little train of thought in the back of your head. And next minute you're going down to cycle sportif down in, in Noosa and asking the main guy, whether he's, he's what his contacts are, uh, but I, it's a good question. I don't actually. I have a feeling the reason why maybe it's starting to bug me is because I kind of mm. seen them pop up. Like you never used to be able to go and specialize them, get them to ship to your door, but give it a few more years. Are they going to slowly have less stores, less retailers? And then suddenly we're pretty much direct to consumer, but we're paying the same price. I, I, I swear that's going to happen. And then we'll still be paying 20 grand and all it's done is it's shipped from China to your front door. There's no store and it's still 20 grand. I just want to call it out. I, 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 I have a feeling we're going to get swindled out of bricks and mortar stores. And this is probably how it would happen. Yeah, exactly. You've got, you've got both options now and then slowly they just sort of merge. The prices merge and yeah, okay. No, I can, I can, I can see that. So that's a good, that's a good shout. And you know, there's the, the whole rumors that Trek are doing something similar to this. Um, even though the kind of way giant works is they still send you to the store. Like you can, you can do your, your impulse purchasing impulse sort of web surfing to, to build up your bike, but you're still redirected to the store ultimately, but it won't take a long for, for that to change. What about the brand itself? Just, just super quickly. Do I have to, do I have to take back my comments about it being an influencer brand now that it's like performing well in like wind tunnels and it's. No, no, because I, I think the, their team, the Israel Premier Tech is, is a bit of, is still mm. a little bit of a joke. Performance wise. So I, no, no, I, it's like a actually surprisingly well performing <laughs> influencer buying, <laughs> but that now it doesn't seem to have as many influences on. I mean, I think Phil Guyman's still on a factor. One of the American crit teams is yeah. on factors, aren't they? Or were, uh, was it, um, could have swore uh, Legion are on them. Yep. The black and yep, white one. 100%. It's still, it's still a big, it's still a big Instagram bike. Don't get me wrong. So I, I'm not, I'm certainly not willing to take back the influencer claim, but I could see Jesse Coyle on a factor. Uh, 
I think there's a there's a match there. It's like it's it's a it's a zag from the the fucking slop Chinese hunk of wood that you're riding around. It's a it's a nod to okay, you've got a little bit of direct to consumer in it, but I don't know. I just think there's 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 data there. There's performance data that shows that it's fast. It shows that you care about these things. You can you can customize your your cockpit quality. You know, there's, there's it's all made in Taiwan, so that's the the full Chinese zag. We're not we're not crossing over to the mainland. You're on the Taiwanese island now. What do you reckon? Absolutely not. Oh. Absolutely not. Because like for in terms of b- riding a bike or a brand, it's more than just the performance, the numbers, right? So if I'm running a factor, okay, like I do think it would be a good bike. I probably, yeah, I would enjoy riding one. I think it'd be fast. I think it's a good bike. But at that price, you you're buying into the brand, like of what the brand is, what the pro side of it is, and I am, imagine riding an an eighteen thousand dollar bike. So Chris Froome can go ride around and get 80th at the Tour de France. Oh, like, that's still there. That storyline. That still makes there. me go, mm. Mm, no, not for that price. No thanks. It doesn't have the for me. It doesn't have the. I don't have the brand buy-in for Factor. That makes me. That makes me interested. I actually think from from that point of view. The the Canyon Air Road. Now I really. I don't think the build's as compelling because I don't like those DT Swiss wheels. I think they're five years too old. But the actual brand of what that what you're paying for to support, Vanderpool, Paris-Roubaix, floating over the cobbles, Philipson, Tour de France sprinting, like that's there I go, yeah, I, I, I do like that. So I, I'd say, and, and actually... Not when I talk about price, it's not because it's like oh, paying eighteen instead of fifteen is like I'm losing my mind about it. But given that I would likely, I don't have any qualms about buying something online anyway. So then going direct to consumer and getting that sort of cheaper price uh, makes sense for me. So I just find the if you know if we're just sort of comparing brands for me, the Canyon with the Aeroad. From the sort of performance to brand froth, for paying that sort of money, is more consistent. I, I I'm more getting around that. Yeah, I can't put my finger on what owning a factor actually says about you. It's a funny brand like that. Um, like there's there's an argument to say, oh, it's it's someone who really appreciates, you know, a quality product because you know, okay, factor own their their factories. You know, it's coming out of Taiwan. They're very, that's the, that's the alleged mystique of the, of the brand. So I'll, I'll certainly give them that, but there's also a little bit of a, um, how do I put this? There, no, there is, there, there's, there's still the fashion element to it, which is perfectly fine, whatever, but I'm not sure it, it doesn't quite marry yet. You've still got this quality matching with a with with a fashion cyclist thing so having having potentially reflected on it 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 probably isn't isn't a Jesse Coyle bike yet i would say i no i think almost exactly that i think it's a pretty it's it's someone that is happy to sp- spend the money and is and I think most of the time, the person writing the fact has probably thought through it. They haven't just done it on a whim. So I, I think that's because it is on the spectrum of this package makes absolutely no sense to this is perfect. It's it's on the closer to perfect uh, side of the spectrum, in my opinion. So yeah, I think you've bought a factor. You've probably thought it through and you like the probably think it's high performance. You probably don't really care that Israel Premier Tech ride it and it's kind of a bit of a joke. But 
that's just a lot of people don't really mind that. It's, it's it's a professional. It's in the pro pro tour. That's about as maybe that's as much as they think about it. Speaking of bikes that I could definitely see Jesse Coyle riding, actually I could see myself riding one of these. Can we talk about the BMC Team Machine R masterpiece? Yes, yes, the masterpiece. They also did it for the regular uh, Team Machine. Yes. It was, bo- yeah, it was for yeah. both of them. Yeah. So, yeah, um, if, if you miss this, it, it's essentially a, um, a, cu- a um, limited edition frame that's going to be built in Europe. Now, I will say I did reach out to, to BMC to get a little bit more details on this. So I will kind of flick in and out of some of the information that I, that I did get back. Um, so, yes, built in Western Europe. I couldn't get clarity beyond Western Europe. Because oh, I was trying to ask, are you building it in your, I think they, they call it the impact um, uh, like factory or studio there. Like Cam Nichols has got videos where he's walking around the place. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm not sure whether it's built in there or somewhere else in Western Europe. Someone can tell me whether Romania is in Western Europe now because that was kind of the, the thing that I was trying to ask. Anyway, um, limited edition version of these bikes um, going to be lighter, stiffer, all that kind of stuff. You can, um, uh, you can customize the, the cockpit on it. Well, it's a frame only. Yes. So the, f- and the frames a hundred grams lighter. So if you get that team machine, R, that new one with the super wide fork, you can get it in the, yeah, get it in the masterpiece, the MPC layup and save a hundred grams. Yes. And it will, it will set you back a tidy $9,000, um, for the frame. Which yes is is a is a number certainly, and um, just just to quickly about the weight, I did ask them about um, build weights, and whilst I didn't get any photos of this, I was uh, assured that a Shimano Dura Ace build with your favourite wheels, those Swiss uh, DT Swiss, I think Arc wheels. Uh, Imagine buying <laughs> this eight thousand dollar. No, sorry, eight <clears throat> not eight thousand dollar. Nine thousand dollar frame to save a hundred grams and putting <laughs> Swiss side <laughs> chonkers on there. Like, what are you doing? Come but on! But that build would be about six point six kilos, so it's it's going to be a very very compellingly fast build. But and this was okay. This is not a this is not a thing for people. Like that's that's. That's the interesting part about why I even wanted to talk about this because I asked them, why are you doing this? I mean, all this, even just us talking about it now just riles people up and gets them annoyed. Like $9,000 for a frame, you dickheads, shut up. Like, what are you talking about? So I kind of asked, I said that. I'm like, basically our audience will think this is a meme. Like sell this idea to me, why you're even doing this and even telling us about it. Just do it in house and don't tell anyone and, give 80 of these frames out to your friends and family. So the, the kind of reply that I, one of the replies that I got was doing this, it's, it's not a bike that is a commercial driver. It's a race bike. The number of people who need and use a race bike is fairly limited, but it's a platform that's driven by passion, a chance to create something that really excites us. It's a platform for bike geeks and one that was created by Bike Geeks. Team Machine R allowed us to create our dream bike, which is the ultimate race bike. Um, and that didn't go anywhere near explaining no. what, still what the point of it is, because they're not selling that many no. of them. Surely that's not bringing in like buckets of revenue that's worth the whole. The masterpiece version of the Team Machine R and the Team Machine SLR. It's both a project that excites our engineer team and really pushes the boundaries of what's possible if we remove as many of the production barriers as possible and also a proof of concept for the brand BMC. It's easy to say we're a performance engineering bicycle company, but sometimes it's also about backing up, backing that up and proving it by taking it a step further. It's not about creating a high value product 
just for the sake of it. It's about keeping our internal team. This is this is the bit. It's about keeping our internal teams, engineers, brand team, etc., hungry and giving us a chance to flex our muscle a bit. It's also why we we do such a limited run of them. Two, it's a passion project, not a sales driver. Okay, yeah. there so we go. It it, it kind of sounds like you know yep. car companies do this all the time. They do these prototype models that never really see the the life of day. They appear at sort of car shows and that sort of thing. And and essentially, it seems like something like that. The the engineers are challenged with, okay, improve the team machine R in some way. Assuming all the the restrictions of mass production have, have been, uh, we don't have to worry about those. What can you do? And out of doing that, you potentially are able to find a new bit of technology or a new way of doing something that you can that flows through to a model that that works down down the line. Yeah, I can get around that. I think most of the frames or a big chunk of them are going to the uh, tutor team. Pretty sure I read that somewhere. Actual, the team will be running a lot of them. Yeah. I, I mean, it's kind of amazing. Like in 2024, like th- there's all these bike brands that are going bust and companies going, It's it seems to be everyone's telling us, whoa. And meanwhile, BMC are working on passion projects. Like, cool. I mean, I, it, that makes me happy that someone's out there trying to push the envelope a bit when it, when it comes to this stuff. But it does seem like... I don't know, whatever BMC are doing to financially secure their company is working if they're able to be working on passion projects. But didn't they, wasn't there a story earlier in the year they 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 were in troubles? Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. BMC applies for government assistance as cycling brands continue to suffer. Oh, well, maybe they got some Swiss Short-time government Short-time working funding. means Swiss government pays wages to avoid layoffs. <laughs> There we go. There we go. Okay. So it's the Swiss government paying the engineers to go and design prototype frames. Oh, dear. Yeah, I didn't realise that. That's uh, that's interesting. I wonder how that went down at the board meeting or the the creditors meeting. Interesting. Um, yeah. Anyway, but it, it the only other thing is this does, from what I understand, solidify the death of the time machine. We will not see another version of the time machine. The team machine R, which has not even, I've never seen one in real life. I don't know if you've ever seen one. Um, We're still hoping to, yeah, lay our eyes on one, but it won't be a masterpiece. Okay. Can I throw something out there? Um, And just feel free to shut me down straight away if I've totally lost my marbles. The frame set only is eight, is $9,000. For a for a limited edition, light, you we we got the specs. The S Works SL8 frame set is five and a half thousand dollars, which is ridden by almost every man and his dog, and is not limited edition, and is pretty ubiquitous now. And there's a lot of people clearly that are willing to pay that much money for that bike or that frame set because they're everywhere. That I actually, I think for a limited edition, that isn't just a limited edition colorway that is built in a different factory and has an entirely different layup to save weight. I kind of feel like that's not crazy (laughs) and is actually almost a better way for some people to spend their money if they were if you're pretty comfortable dropping five and a half K on an S works pay an extra three and a half and you get a, 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 almost a custom laid up we BMC. haven't seen the team machine R in any tests have we no mm, no looks fast though does look fast. It look, yeah. as, as as the magazine to say, it looks fast yeah. standing still. No, it's uh, 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 I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree with you. Um, BMC though, it's it's just a again, it's local bias. It's just a funky 
brand here, um, certainly in, in Sydney, we just don't see many of them. For some reason, there's bucket loads of them in Queensland. Um, I don't know how well it performs in the US, but it's, yeah. I feel like with with this frame, with this master, with and specifically the Team Machine, sorry, the, yeah, Team Machine R, Okay, in comparison to like the factor, it's like you're buying a bit of engineering. Does that make sense? Like they really lean hard into that. And I think that pays off. So you're right. I, I would say that if, you're, if you are considering these premium top end things, it's not, it's not actually ridiculous. There's a point of difference to this to this frame, I think, is what I'm trying to say. But, yes, maybe that's the right way to to probably put it. It's like, yeah, it's <laughs> still more expensive than an S works, but there's still, yeah, there's still a difference there. Uh, if you've got anything else on BMC, but I just wanted to quickly mention a bit of sad news, Jesse, our favourite bike, Chris's. Bike that doesn't look like he's ever going to get to ride, the Simplon Pride 2. Simplon have entered self administration. So it doesn't look like I'm going to be riding around on a Simplon Pride mm. 2 anytime soon. Yeah. Oh, dear. I don't know. What's happened there? Did I, did I mention this when I was at the Eurobike thing when I was talking about walking around there? It was just, it was just a weird brand. Like they had this stall outside, they didn't have an inside stall, and there was probably 50 bikes at their stall. 46 of them were e-bike commuters and then like, cause it was a test track. Right. And then there was one simple on pride Two that was like in the corner that no one wanted to look at. So it was, it, it maybe, um, Robert even mentioned this when he, when he talked about how surprised he was that the simple on one, well, had led those tour magazine tests that it just was a, a brand that was, going a completely different direction and just out of nowhere made this incredibly fast frame set and didn't know what to do with it. And I would argue they didn't know what to do with it and they've kind of failed a bit with it. So look, self-administration isn't a death knell, but um, it is, what were they saying? So they're, they're saying that sales, their sales when it shows how quickly things turn for these guys. They were, they were normal this time last year, but their sales are down 30% since spring 2024. And that's what's pushed them into self-administration. So that's like, what are we in now? Just in October. So we're looking at five months of bad sales has pushed you into self-administration. So yeah, not a, not a good bit of information, unfortunately, for them. God, I've just clicked the article for this. You put in the Campagnola Super Record S in the notes here. I, I I don't know how I missed this. The first time I've seen it, I've just clicked it. Look how big their front derailleur is. <laughs> it's it's bigger than the wheel top one and the rear derailleur. What are they? T- Have you seen them in real no. life? So it's a, it's essentially, sorry, can we just talk, what are we talking about? Can you te- oh, tell, it's, tell everyone uh, what we're talking well, about I here? Well, I just clicked the article. It's, 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 it's Campagnola's new uh, group set of the people. Uh, four thousand two hundred ninety nine dollars. It's there. It shaves a thousand dollars off the top end super record. So it's there essentially their Shimano Ultegra, Ultegra SRAM Force level electronic yeah. group set. Low grade slop. Look yeah. at that low grade slop. Interesting yeah. that they've stuck with calling it Super Record S. It's like calling yeah. it Shimano Dura Ace L. L. Hmm. Uh, yep. Wasn't that Light. always called yeah. Chorus? Well, no, this would have been record. Oh, sorry, record. Oh, yeah, wouldn't this be record yeah. EPS? Okay, yep. change the naming yep. structure. This would have been record. But I mean, I mean, just look how big the derailers are. I've seen them in real life. So the not the S version, but the actual they're they're as horrendous as it, they okay, look. I'm not overblowing it. It is okay. No, they're massive, massive. It's like, but it's the the actual shape of it is like a. <laughs> Remember, right? Do you ever, people? Do you ever see people riding those like testicle lights that hang off the back of saddle mm-hmm. 
the the rear of saddles yeah. and they're like glow. You ever see yeah. those? It's kind of like two of those together on the rear derailleur. It's just, I, yeah. Anyway, um, I don't know. I just wanted to put this in because this isn't necessarily new. I think this was launched. This was even bizarre. Like this was launched three or four weeks ago. I don't, most of the main outlets didn't really even pick it up. Mm. And Cycling Weekly, who did pick it up, it's like it's it's kind of the reviews. Like, what is this? Is this a meme? Like, are you, are you serious? Four thousand two hundred dollars, and you're telling this it's a like group set of the people. But even beyond that, like, if you okay, yes, it is matte black, and I will say that does look spectacular mm -hmm. from a color perspective. But the the sizing's all out because you've got these enormous rear derailleur and, and front derailleur, and then you've got this tiny chain ring, tiny front chain ring, which again is this really nice matte black piece of carbon, mm. but no power meter. So this is, you may remember, so Campag did launch a power meter that I think Shane Miller tr tried to get his hands on. We haven't actually seen any review. No, he hasn't been able to get any any hands on it. It's this sort of white unicorn at this point. Mm -hmm. And so this that 4,200 does not include a power meter. Whether you'll be able to slap on the $2,500 power meter on top of this, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Okay. But there's just nothing in here that isn't a meme, really. The gearing's interesting. Did you see this? So... Yeah. They've like, got by interesting yeah, okay. Six chain ring options, the smallest being a forty five twenty nine, the biggest being a fifty four thirty nine. But then they also go down to a ten tooth cassette. So they've got cassette ten twenty seven, ten twenty nine, and then the biggest is an eleven thirty two. Which is still quite small. Um I know a lot of people are choosing with Shimano are choosing the 34 option in the cassette. I mean, that's what you run and you're racing. Um, so it, uh, someone at a, more of a club level doing more climbing is, is easily going to be benefiting from that 34 uh, cassette. So it only got up to a 32. And then they've got these really tightly, um, you know, the 1027 cassette, that kind of, tighter range uh, which I'm guessing then to make that work you're then going to choose the smaller chain ring options otherwise like a, 20, a 27 tooth in the easiest gear is not very big so you're going to need small chain rings for that. so you're going to end up with a small um, crank set which maybe if you're a like a older Italian guy and you want the smaller look of the you don't like the look of the big cassette you'd pick that but that does seem a step backwards to be going smaller cassettes, smaller chain rings. I mean, in this review from Cycling Weekly, they've said it's 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 just way more expensive than Shimano, the Shimano electronic options. Um, I think the reason why it doesn't get much airtime is it's just not compelling, really, in any way, other than the looks and the heritage. So it's just not really getting reviews because it's it's just it's not it's not really. But beating. even even the 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 classic like Bianchi fanboy who's on a Specialisma on a rim brake bike and he's like, you know what? I'm gonna make the switch. I'm gonna go to disc. Okay, I'm gonna get a Bianchi because that's what I do, or a Colnago. Cool. Right, group set. What? And and even if and even if you you're still compelled by campy, you look at it, you go, yeah, it's campy. Don't have my thumb sh don't don't have my thumb shifters anymore. That's the sort of iconic part of it. It definitely doesn't that, that have the aesthetics anymore. And and I would I always argued that EPS, which I rode. I rode EPS record 11 speed for a year on that legend was the fastest shifting 11 speed out there. It was outrageously good. You, you can't say the same about this wireless group set from, from the, the reviews that we've seen. And I have seen Edwin build up a couple 
and yeah, they're they're not that slick. Last little bit of news for you, Jesse. Yeah, this is this is right in your wheelhouse, I reckon. Oh, okay. Strava updates. Strava have listened. Oh, sort of. To people, have you? So, have you logged into Strava and and and? I mean, they're every uploaded hour. Uploaded a ride recently. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I, so I went quick to edit. edit my title, and then the whole menu was different. Um, is quick that... edit. Yeah, okay. so we've got quick edit on there now. So, uh, yeah, you as soon as you upload the file before it, it plants it on the feed. It gives you an option to to go through and and customize, give you title, your ride. You know, hide metrics, show metrics, all that kind of stuff before it actually is planted on the feed. In the past, you had to go back in and edit it. And I think this is, honestly, I think this is one of the best updates they've made ever. And um, you can't, un this actually, this actually, I don't use, I don't go on to Strava to do anything other than build a route, uh, Strava stalk, People, when I, so when I came to Noosa, I Strava stalked Cam and the guys that he rode with for the routes that they ride. Did that because I'm a weirdo. And yeah, the odd KOM, the, the odd sort of um, hill KOM. I don't do any, I don't do any social media on there. This changes me because I'm actually, I'm interested to scroll through my Strava news feed now to just see what people, are calling their rides and what's what's happening? Like, what's Coil giving me? Okay, I know where he rode, but maybe he's going to give me some zone three tough day on the bike D info. Uh, I, I might get it. I didn't shot. see this. So what happens? Your ride uploads, and then what do you mean? It sits pending in the app. Yep, yep. So as soon as you then open the app up, you get the quick edit, and quick edit will allow you to. Do exactly that. So change, change all your metrics, and it's not, it's not as clunky as it used to be. It's um, where where you felt like you were sort of going back, like behind the ride, in into the back end to to edit it, and then it was being re-uploaded. This is all oh, sort of almost appearing in the I front end. I see. So they're trying to get yeah. they're trying to fix the thing of you open your feed and it's just morning ride, morning ride, morning Correct. ride, morning ride. Correct. Okay. So cool. you you will know this, but actually have a guess. What percent of rides are get custom titles? How did you think I would know that? <laughs> I don't know because <laughs> you're on Strava. Uh, oh, it'd be it it wouldn't be many. Seven percent. No, no, it's it's more than that. So it's around twenty percent. Twenty percent get a custom. Around 80% are just left at morning ride on the public feed. That doesn't include like the private, private rides. Yeah. So, but okay. it, there was some, some sort of statistic then that a, you will know this, that a custom title receives 12 times the kudos wow. a morning ride will get. Wow. Mm. So no, but this is, I mean, I've, I've long said that I just don't use Strava as a social media app. I actually potentially will change doing that. Even since being here, I've logged on to Strava a few times and just scrolled the feed mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh, Edwin did that ride. Interesting. And instead of like what the ride was just being morning ride, I actually got a little bit of info, you know, gorgeous slop fest. Oh, interesting. Go in, have a look. Where did they stop? Oh, yeah. Nine hours elapsed, waste of time. Yep, mm -hmm. all good. Um, so, no, I'm, I'm on board with that. And the other thing, and this is this is very specific to you and your outdated Wahoo Bolt version 0 0.2, they're doing a full Strava segment audit. So there's something like 600,000 dead Strava segments out there mm -hmm. that seemingly your computer seems to be picking up. Yep. So we went down to do Amy's and we did, we did a, like a warm up ride and that kind of stuff. And we get back, we both did the exact same ride and your computer's like, you're like top eighting <laughs> like, right, it was segments that no one's done in 33 years. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know what's going on. Maybe like it's picked up how old your, your bloody bike computer is, but. 
the bloody funds over for you. They're going, they're going to do a, a wipe through. And the other thing is they're actually adding verified segments. I like this. I really like this. Mm. So instead of the, what's the marquee segment in Sydney or what's the big one in Melbourne? No, it's going to be verified. So you're okay. going to have, you're going to have full, uh, full blue tick action on, on a select few segments. So I'm on board with this. I think I'm, I think was Strava bought by someone or some capital investment firm came in. I can't remember, but no, this is good. Leaning more into the social media element of the of the platform. Cool. All right, Chris. I know you wanted to talk about the Road World Championships, but there was unfortunately one event which overshadowed almost the entire thing for me, and that was the passing of the eighteen year old Swiss rider Muriel Führer in the under nineteen women's race. Um, she crashed and unfortunately wasn't really seen by any officials and for some period of time was left uh, crashed, not being responded to. Eventually, when she was found, she was airlifted by helicopter to hospital and passed away um, shortly after. And so uh, condolences to her family and everyone that knew her um, and rest in peace, Muriel. Uh, Riders sh- shouldn't be having to risk life and limb to compete in this sport we love and it is, it is just shocking to continuing to see accidents like this occur um i really genuinely hope the uci can implement changes to make this sport safer for all that are competing in it and for the time being we just say rest in peace muriel and we will carry on with our uh, road board championships wrap up we're going to talk about the world championships jesse oh for we're going to lean into your insight because it's what the people want. You know what this is like? This chat is like when you're on a group ride and then you've got to sort of roll through and then just someone you've never met before comes up beside you and they go, oh, oh did you watch, you watch, watch Worlds? Oh, you know, it was a, you know, he, he was so really strong today, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Oh, they let him go and... Oh, ben O'Connor did well for second. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's, you know, he's such an amazing rider. Yeah. I can't believe they let him go. Yeah, yeah. Is, are we, is that what we're going to do? Like, that's <laughs> all I've got. That's literally all I've got. I don't know what other insight or chat I can add to this. Although everyone wants to seem, everyone wants to talk about it. But is there really anything to say? In your opinion, then, was it more a fuck up from Belgium, Netherlands, Australia, the main teams, to let a guy who really doesn't have a team around him? Okay, yes, he does have Primoz and Luca Mezgets and a few, and a few, but ultimately the strength of that team is is vastly inferior to to those other teams. So was it more the the, the fuck up side, or was it more the elite extreme performance of today that we need to be historic, amazing, all that, all that sort of stuff. Uh, K solo, if, wow. I think um, I'm firmly on the side of fuck up. I agree. Um, like you can always say in hindsight, well, we thought we, you know, with Belgian team on the front and they'd be able to bring him back or, we thought he'd get tired and it was too early, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, Remco and Vanderpool should be glued to his wheel the entire time. Like I watched the bit where he attacked and he goes and you're kind of like, well, there's a few scattered on the other side of the road and I think Quinn Simmons was sort of there. And you're kind of looking back and there's a, maybe Ben O'Connor was sort of Further forward, you're like, where? What are you doing? Today's yeah. gapping, that gap's going, and you're kind of looking, why are you not following him? Like, it's as simple as that. If you follow him there, he sits up because he's not getting a gap eventually, and you're one lap closer to the finish of the race, and Pagacha hasn't ridden away yet. And then what do you do the next time you're on the climb? Well, you go behind him and you follow him. And then, yeah, maybe he's stronger than everyone. And gets a gap because he's just stronger. But if that's going to happen, that's going to happen anyway. I don't s- saying, oh, you know, well, it was a bit early. We we thought we'd bring him back. 
it's not like that's just a cook up. Like, it's, it's why would you leave it to chance? Yeah, uh, that that's my sort of take. Uh, you can just see the difference of a national team to a professional well-oiled team. Like you remember this year's two. Or okay, ultimately Tade was way too good for Jonas, but it was almost a joke how like Jonas was basically taking pisses when Tade did. He was taking water bottles when Tade. He was just following him around everywhere. And I just don't understand why the same tactic wasn't installed here. And it's not like he had, you know, a, a 30, 40 minute climb at the end somewhere to to just ride Remco off his wheel. I, I just, yeah, it just felt like a little bit of amateur hour when it came to to that. And and then it, I was just the only thing that that kind of brings up is to counter myself. And I don't think this was the case because I'm giving way too much credit credit to like a tactical nuance. But there is a universe in which... Now, this, again, this isn't the case because they weren't in the position to decide whether to follow him or not. They were too far back. But the big brain move, even though it didn't pay off, would be it's 100K to go. We know that if he's doing these blistering attacks... Inside 60k to go, he'll probably be able to drop us, us being Remco and Vanderpool. So we're going to let him cook up his race and attack with 100k to go. And we're going to pray that our teams are strong enough to keep the gap close. And then once he's dangled out there for an hour and taken the sting out of his legs, we're then going to use our teammates to bring him back, attack over the cross, across. And it's actually a tactical move to let him go at 100k to go. There's like maybe a 3% chance that was an active decision. I reckon that's just they weren't in the position to follow and then he gapped and then they were Well, crying. that's what Van der Poel specifically said that. He thought, he he said, no, nah, I went too early. We'll ride him back. He's going to cock up his race here. I mean. But I reckon that's what you, I think you, okay. But I reckon you only say that when of course you've screwed up and he's gotten a gap and then you say, well, yeah, well, let yep. him do it on purpose. Yep. Like, of course. <laughs> um, great to see the return of Suki Remco. Can I just say, love Suki Remco, big fan of Suki <laughs> Remco. Um, yep. We've all been Suki Remco at some point, um, not with the Watts, but certainly the Sukiness. Um, my my particular favourite Suki Remco moments are when he might, he, he'll whack, he'll whack <laughs> like 600 watts or 500 watts for like three <laughs> minutes on a bird <laughs> with everyone in his wheel, not get yep. a gap, then flick his elbow. <laughs> like turn around and just have bikes cross-eyed behind him yeah, and then be like, what the fuck? Why are we rolling through? It was like, <laughs> because you're trying to drop us, dickhead. Yeah. yeah. And um, I'll pull one 20-second turn and you're going to fucking attack <laughs> over the top. Yeah. Why would I do anything? Yeah. Uh. So, yeah, great to see the return of him. Um, it's uh, always, always good. Uh, what else? Um, I did... Yeah, okay, it's probably a bit cliche to mention Ben O'Connor, but does it does it mean he's a he's he's got a, a classic in him somewhere? Because I was I'll be honest, I was blo- I did not see that in in Ben O'Connor. Um maybe I should have, but potentially there's a there's an LBL sort of results podium somewhere in in, in him interestingly enough. Um I think um Ben's a I kind of find it interesting that He's a really good lesson in that he's got no showmanship. Like on the bike, he's just generic, kind of tall cyclist. He doesn't really have much panache. He doesn't really do show show attacks. He's like the most run of the mill, forgettable rider. But he's but he's not riding for flair. He's he, he's consistently overperforming results wise, and it's such a good lesson. Comparing that to just like, like, I know Remco's a lot better, but like comparing that to kind of mouthing off showman Remco to that kind of has the steez to like steezless Ben O'Connor, but has this Palmares that you could argue he he he's doesn't really have the physical. I say sorry, I shouldn't even say that. That he's sort of overperforming um, tactically, but arguably at the Spencer as. Uh, um, of kind of 
doing a few Steez attacks and, uh, you know, maybe maybe riding in a cooler looking position or I don't know, just doing stuff no, that doesn't really mean. get more results. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think it's kind of a really, and also for the fact that also plays into the tactics is like he, they continually not, don't respond to his attacks <laughs> because of that under the radarness. Yep. And I think it's a good lesson. Yep. Definitely. For a lot of riders. And I think that, you could almost argue, so the USA also had, I would argue, probably one of their better world champs. In fact, so if you look at, they had Simmons, Van Marker, Paulus, Jorgensen, and McNulty at the front of the race at most moments of, of the race, um, which is a lot of depth when it comes to a nation that hasn't really been pulling its own weight when it's come to, to road racing, certainly one day road racing. Um, Jorgensen's probably the pick of the bunch when it, when it comes to that, probably you could argue a little bit in the, the O'Connor mold of just doing what needs to get done. You know, he, he has got classics to his name. Maybe that's a little bit more due to the strength of the team that he's, that he's, that he's ridden with, but he certainly showed that he's got the ability to, to do a big result on a big kilojoule day. And my God, they are big kilojoule days, those world championship races. Holy God. Be remiss not to mention under 23's men's winner. <laughs> it was on a, it was on a Gen, Gen 6 Madone. Just want to mention it. Just want to say. And I, I was uh, also alluded to a couple of rim break TCRs in that same oh, race, actually. Wow. There you go. In the under 23's. Yep. Yeah. They're what old. A- um, Sunweb spec TCRs, which I must say I did froth at the time. Like the the Demoulin, I think Michael Matthews was even running that rim that that spec bike at one point. Big fan. Yeah. No, that's yeah, that uh that Nicholas Behrens is on uh the previous the fastest Madone ever made. Uh with a separate handle with with narrower, just separate bar stem. And it's kind of good when you're on the development team, you, you can kind of just do whatever you want a little bit because he's not, he's on the development little track team, not the world tour team. There you go, Jesse. That wasn't too bad. Was it? That wasn't too bad. I think there was some insight. I actually found what you said kind of interesting, believe it or not. Oh, well, I'm, I'm glad. Yeah. <laughs> Did you watch the Poggy interview with Atia? Yes. Okay. Good. Right. Oh, the Atia butchering yep. of cycling okay. stuff. It just, oh my God. Like, why are you talking in VAM? What? Like, that doesn't make you sound smart. It just makes you sound like an idiot because no one discusses VAM besides you and like 10 Italian blokes that have been tracking records. Like, that's not a metric we were using. Like, it depends on the gradient. We're talking, what's per kilo? Why? Like, what do you mean? He's like, he's up. And he's for up. what? He's he up. says, oh, I, Tate's like, I do 1700 VAM. What? Yeah, for how long? Yeah. <laughs> what what do you what is this? Right. Uh, okay. Can I just credit credit to Atia? Clearly he has yes. a little bit of <laughs> of cycling history knowledge. Pro that blew my mind. He clearly has yeah. pro cycling history knowledge, potentially beyond mine. Um and yeah, he he, he asked And he, he, he's managed to get a sit down with Tate Pagacha. Yeah. Now can we can we talk about the big one that everyone's friggin' brains exploded with on every, every Instagram reel I saw this week was, yeah, I do five hour rides at 320 Watts and it's zone two and everyone's. All right. Yeah. But that's cause it's that, that it's the Inigo San Milan Bizarro's make believe zone two based on some thingies came up. It's not zone two that, that anyone else uses. It's their weird, some lactate based, proprietary thing that he's come up with and called it zone two. And it's not what it's not endurance. Um, because didn't he say it was, it was like three fifty yeah. Watts or something. And he said, Can I just take a, take a breath? I'm going to sound like a screaming ranting maniac. If I keep going like this, so I'm just going to center myself and try and have a normal conversation. You're going to bring up something. I'm going to puff a fish straight away. And then this is going to be a pointless conversation <laughs> that no one's going to want to listen to. So I'll try and speak like a sane human being, but please continue. <laughs> so 
320 watts with a heart rate at 150 for six hours is allegedly the zone two. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So th- that's not, I rem- I could have swore he said on some of his climbing zone two, he said, didn't he say three, four? Yeah. So that's true. Uh, yeah. Okay. It, so three, it's that, that's actually not insane. So if his FTP at 60, if his, at sort of 65, 66 kilos is, would be probably 430, uh, four, maybe 440 watts. Um, cause that would be like 440 at 65 kilos would be 6.7 watts per kilo, 6.76, 6.77, which is probably not far off. And so if that raw number sounds ridiculous, but then when you do, we can, the zones that we all work in as percents of FTP and you're working back from 440, uh, 74% of FTP, which would be in a classic zone model up, up the top end of zone two bordering on tempo would be 325 Watts, um, kind of middle of zone two that most of us use, most of us use, let's say 65%, that's 286 Watts. And so if he's doing a climbing route with descents, and so he's going upper classic zone two, at let's say seventy percent, at four forty watts. That's three hundred and ten, and so yeah, he would be worked. That would be his zone two as we define it. Now I I don't really see how you're getting anything above three twenty, according to almost any zone definition to be zone two. That's that's tempo. That's yep. Yeah, moderate aerobic. So that four, when he's talking about three forty, that that's probably more. I'm doing tempo on the climbs because I'm having descending, and then I'm going to call that an endurance ride. Yeah, but that's you know that's okay. Now that's him because he's super fit, but also a big classics rider would have a FTP higher than that. Like you might, if you look at, let's say, Ganna, his FTP might be four sixty. Yeah. So if he's riding around it. High zone two, let's say seventy percent of FTP. He's running around at three hundred and twenty-two watts. Uh, that's there's that's what you have to do. I mean, obviously the the weight difference is 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 real, but I went for a few endurance rides with with Jay in Canberra. I couldn't ride next to him. I had to ride threshold next to him <laughs> because that's what his zone two was. Yeah. And I, when you're crazy fit, I you know I sit in the pocket. I sit back there. Yep. Because it is, and and that's yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's that's the level of what's the, that are being put out by by these guys. I don't have, I don't know. I just I just couldn't grasp why we're all losing our shit about that this week. That one of the greatest cyclists ever rides at a pretty high wattage. But anyway, and then especially at his weight and size, um, I mean, on a flattish route, you can imagine the speeds. If he's sitting at three hundred and ten watts for four hours. You know, he's probably averaging 40, you know, for an endurance ride. Like it just gets actually logistically difficult <laughs> just from a safety perspective. I mean, what routes are we, you doing where you can just sit on three? He said that. He said that like in, in the thing because he, he lives um, around Monaco that it's he ends up riding at a, at a higher power on the climbs just because um, he needs to get out of the city. And then he can't ride at his zone two level around around that city sort of area. And of course, then he's got hills and bits and pieces. He did mention that it was a logistic challenge to actually ride endurance where he lives, which kind of makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I did. I did like his. I don't know whether it was a backhand. It was like a a weird sledge of the power meter. Where did you get this bit where he's like, "Oh, I trained to heart rate." Yeah, yeah. I mean, his heart yeah. rate. Why like, do you do that? Oh, because not all heart, not all power meters are accurate these days. Like, yeah, he's. I mean, I think he, I, from memory, he specifically said, "Oh, if the temperature changes, my power meter doesn't work that well." Um, I think we even in like consistent temperatures, the Shimano one's got its issues. Um, but yeah, he pretty much said it. There's. Yeah, his power meter doesn't work. Um, and I, I, I thought it was quite interesting that the anytime, uh, 
it wasn't Inigo Samuel. Well, I keep thinking of Inigo. It was uh, Peter Atia asked him a question, um, sort of about, are you doing this testing? Are you using this to measure? It was all quite basic. Mm. It was sort of, well, we do lactate tests at team camp. Um, I rarely do a VO2 max test. Um, I'll train, my power meter doesn't work that well. So I generally train to sort of to heart rate and, and a bit of effort level. And yeah, like uh, it's all and very, I, sort of, I, I don't <laughs> eat chocolate not that much anymore to lose weight. Mm. I'm yeah, like, do you, oh, okay. Yeah. 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 What do you do with diet? Oh, well, you know, I just dial it in a little bit and don't get Uber eats as much. Eat. Yeah. Eat, eat, uh, fuel on the bike. Yeah. Eat, you know, hundred grams of carbs an hour. Um, it did, it did, I did feel as well. You never know. Like, is it the old sort of not giving away stuff that pro cyclists tend to do or is it actually, can I, can I speculate? Yeah. Actually, I'm going to speculate. That's what we want. So I, from a training, uh, point of view, my suspicion is it is kind of like that. I don't think he's lying. I don't think that he secretly got someone following around on a on a moped with a lactate analyzer and he's just pretending he doesn't do it or that he's in the lab doing step tests every fortnight. I don't I don't think that's the case. I think he's being truthful. I think the bit that he that didn't get discussed and that is likely done far more would be more of the medical and the blood testing health side. I think th- he'd be getting labs done. At team camps, probably weekly. At home, probably monthly at least. He's getting monitored. He's not just, oh, I'm just going to, you know, cut my calories back and just sort of ride around for a month and at, at an effort level based training. Like, no, no, no. They, they, they've, they've got eyes on what's happening internally. So I think. They don't, he didn't really ask them too much about the medical tracking side. And I think that's where there would be significant oversight. I mean, these UAE have medical, they have multiple medical staff and physicians that are monitoring him. Um, So I think if there was somewhere where he's probably underselling it, it would be not on the training side, but on the medical side. Question without notice, which pro cyclist would you like to interview on the Neuro Show? If we could have one pro cyclist. In, in, like, it would be an in studio, so not remote. We get to properly sit down with one pro cyclist. My answer is Wout Van Art. Because I think there's more, there's more going on under the hood than he lets on. There's little snippets of it that pops out in, in some of these like Netflixy things, but I reckon Mm. there's a, there's an animal in there. And I reckon he's, I reckon he's also big into his gear and his tech and he's, yep. You know, I, I think so. I, I do. Yeah, I think so. I, there's almost two questions there. There's who would you want to interview if they had to give detail? Well, part of it would be, who do you think you can get detail? Out so of? yeah. And um, well, that's the, yes, that's the other side of, okay. If you, if, if, you, if they're just going to answer the, if they're just going to speak like they normally would, you'd want to ask someone who's naturally can, is elaborating on things. So that's probably, I think, in the scheme of things, Tade's mm. pretty good. He was giving he was giving nuggets yeah. there. If that was Vingegaard, you're probably not getting much. Um, but I I always find like with Wow the this season structure between season ends, then you're smashing cyclocross season. Then you're doing grand tours. There's- uh, you've got you've got the Rigo campaign in Colombia first. Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah. Yep. Starts there. Um, so I think there'd be, but you have to have a you. A lot of pros aren't that smart. So if you ask them questions, they just don't really know. So you'd it'd have to be a pro that actually is invested in what they're doing. I think someone like, uh. If you wanted to have like a, if trainer road, if you're going to do a trainer road spec, like a Matteo Jorgensen, like knows actually what he's doing and is invested in it. So you'd probably get a lot more out of a guy like him. I think that'd be probably if it was doing a training related thing, uh, that'd be cool. Yeah. So you want training stuff, don't you? No, I don't want that. I want, 
I want you want drama. I want world to a bubble chat. Oh, yeah. I want the what's going on in the bubble. Oh, like you want to speak with Mark Hershey? I oh, is Hershey the man? Good. Yeah, he interesting. He's a little. Little gossip hound. Yeah, you know? I want to know like <laughs> who's who's in with who. I don't know why I think that. I just okay. He's got the writing style of someone that's got bubble chat. And then I want like you know that's a dog of a bike. I wouldn't go on them. <laughs> like, that's 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 who I want. I want that person. I... Who's been on the most teams? Who's who's farmed around and they can just. Um... The only other thing I wanted to mention was something that. Well, we haven't mentioned, and. I don't even know. Well, maybe maybe I should just ask you, why don't I care about Lachlan Morton riding around Australia? So, I've it's easily one of the certainly from other Australian people that I get direct messages of. Why haven't you talked about this? It's right. It's okay. it's yeah. un-Australian for you to have not discussed this subject. And it's not out of any, I just don't care. I don't get it. No, it's not that I don't get it. I get it. I I totally get why he's doing it. But there's no, like the physical achievement of it doesn't mean anything to me. There's no story. I I don't know. I just don't care. Sorry. I really don't. But that, that goes for all the ultra distance stuff. It's just not in my wheelhouse. I would, maybe it's just because I don't have any desire to do anything like that ever in my life that I don't then resonate to it. Um, but yeah, I just, I find, I saw one there saying, why haven't you spoken about Lockie? Are you jealous of him? Like the, the idea of riding around the country non-stop unsupported is my idea of hell. So no, I'm not jealous of it. Yeah. I don't know. It is for, it is sort of kind of for charity. So part of the effort is to raise funds for the indigenous literacy foundation. He's raised $71,300. So which is great, but that doesn't. Yeah, we don't talk about like, every uh, charity ride no. that's ever been ridden. I mean, we didn't talk about well, Amy's Grand Fondo's, the reason that the Amy Grand Fondo exists in the first place, that's... which was cycling advocacy. So why am I forced to then talk about this particular charity thing? I don't know. It just seems like this this ma- has managed to get like some sort of cultish following that I don't get. Sorry. I yes no no I I I mean I, yeah I it's not. I wasn't rushing into the notes of, to put put it in as a talking point. I also don't really. I don't want to be. Yeah, I can kind of be negative. I don't know. He's a pro rider that's paid as a pro on the team. Probably paid pretty decent money. Who has like five staff. Oh, one's his wife, but five supporters following him around with a camper van full of Cannondale Lab seventy ones to beat a you know. Right around Australia, sort of a salt of the earth punters record as a phys- as as a as a like athletic challenge. Yeah, he's crushing mega K's, and it's kind of impressive from a physiological point of view. As a, as a competitive outlet, I don't really care. I care more about racing, cycling. Um, yes. Yeah. So there's that, but what for me, I mean, you have to separate the fact that there is no doubt that the guy is done in good, just purely the charity thing, but also he clearly inspires people to ride bikes, which is awesome. Fantastic. Get around that. Um, but it doesn't engage me. And just like you said, so I remember when I was um, chatting to Tyler about, so his ultra stuff, and he was really honest about it. He was like, I'm, I'm there with like my three ca- canyons, like spaceships. And, and it's, it's just a, it's a pure logistics race like who has the best logistics and the guy he was competing against just had like one bike and his wife and like a pickup truck and he had like friggin' three bikes a film crew a camper van a follow car a nutritionist speed suits aero suits and he's just like this is almost embarrassing 
like what's going and on and three hundred thousand YouTube subscribers. Yeah. So waiting <laughs> to see how you go. Uh, yeah, but uh, you know he's totally honest about it. Um, but yeah, anyway. So look, I don't don't hate it. I know it's just not something we would have even really brought no. up. There's only like it's, it's just, only that I'm getting sledged for this I constantly. I don't know. It's funny that people are like. Why are you avoiding this? Un-Australian. Like oh. Jesse, un-Australian, which is the, the ultimate criticism, oh. <laughs> supposedly, <laughs> especially if you're currently residing in Queensland. Um, all right, before we go, Jesse, uh, I want to finish up with this one. I've been running recently the Hubbard Strap. Have you seen the Hubbard Strap before? Oh, no. I've been running a Hubbard strap. It's my dirty little secret, Jesse. Uh, so let me explain what happened here. Um, yeah, I've had issues with chest straps, just, just as we all have, but that's not been the reason. So a- as you know, I started for some of those events running like the pendant for the Insta360 camera, and it kind of mounted itself down here sort of between the nipple. And that was the best sort of spot. But the best sort of spot was right where the fob was of the heart rate monitor, right? Because it was a little groove in there that it would sit in. And for Amy's, I was like, oh, that's a really good spot to have it. Oh, I know. I'll run a Hubbard strap. So this is a heart rate monitor that goes on your, well, alleged bicep, right? Started running it. And it was perfect for that scenario. Worked. Ran the pendant here. All good. Happy days. I haven't looked back, Jesse. I haven't looked back. No, yeah, I thought you were going to say that. There, that. there is a cult yep. following yep. of people that hate wearing chest heart rate yep. straps and either then just ditch heart rate or they, they move to that. So I just would never be able to get over the look of it. Do you put it under yes, your sleeve? And so my, <laughs> my, my biggest... Um, Issue was because I'm a sleeve roller very often because the I basically just ride the narrow suit and the, the sleeves are quite long. And so when it does warm up or maybe I've finished a session or something, I do the sleeve roll. Big fan of the sleeve roll. It just shows session's done, we're home. Um, mm-hmm. So when I actually sleeve roll, I would always think, oh, that could actually crumple it up and cause cause issues. No, no issues there because where it sits, it's, it's above those scenarios. Um, Comfort-wise, I actually almost forget that it's – on, which is great, and um, accuracy. It's been absolutely flawless. It's this particular one is uh, rechargeable, so there's mm-hmm. that. And also, you get less sweat there, and so I'm thinking there's potential for more longevity than it being in the pure mm. like sweat fest of between your nipples. Um, yeah. So look. It's my dirty little secret that I've been hiding um, recently. Watch this space. I meant to wear. I, I I I was almost certain you put it on the forearm. Yeah. Or you. I, mean, I guess it's just seeing through the skin, so it probably works both. Just up in there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great, great moment. Hmm. All right. Well, that's that's my dirty little secret this week, Jesse. Unless you have. Uh, Anything to add? I think we might call this episode done. Done? No, I didn't have anything else. Cool, cool. Well, we will uh, see everybody next week back in studio. Uh, until then, Jesse, we will see Sounds you then. Sounds good. Chat to you next week.